Father Donald Calway, MIC, is a convert to Catholicism and is a member of the Marian Fathers. He has been a priest for 17 years, authored 14 books, and leads pilgrimages to Marian shrines around the world. His latest book, Consecration to St. Joseph, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father, is an international bestseller, and a website to get that book is on consecrationstjoseph.org. Let's welcome Father Donald. Thanks, brothers. Uh, I know things are a little different this year for sure, um, but these guys are pulling off a pretty professional job here. I'm actually a little nervous because it's all everything's like clockwork here. Usually at men's conferences, it's kind of late. Everything's always late, but not this one. So I know we just prayed a rosary, but uh, please join me in a Hail Mary as well and asking St. Joseph uh, to, to bless this conference and to bless my talk as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, guardian of the Virgin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so um, definitely good to be back here. I was here, I think it was four years ago. Um, for those in attendance, I know we're also doing the live stream. And at that time at the church, they were doing the renovations. There was scaffolding and we had to kind of climb around it almost. Uh, but it was a great event, so it's good to see that the, the church is done now. It's beautiful. And a lot's happened, of course, since then, especially in this crazy year that we're living right now. Uh, couldn't get much more crazy, but I think it's going to. Um, we are living in serious times, brothers. You know this. Uh, so much so that yesterday, when I was flying here, there was something that was just was disturbing me. Um, because I've been hearing it a lot. And I thought to myself, I've never done this before, but, you know, just kind of keeping up with the times and the current slogans and language and things like that. I don't know. I, I, I just got my phone out and I said, I'm going to write this down, my thoughts on this. So I want to read that to you. And I'll start the talk talking about consecration to St. Joseph with what um, I wrote down yesterday on, on the flight coming here. Hopefully you'll know what I'm talking about. You probably do. Um, here we go. Now, this probably is the most poetic thing I've ever written. Um, but this is what came to me as I'm sitting in my, my, my chair on the, on the plane. There's a lot of talk today that uses the slogan, Build Back Better. Dear friends, any desire to remake or reset, that's another word we're hearing these days, the great reset, to remake or reset society to something better requires the centrality of the Holy Trinity and the restoration of the importance and holiness of the family. This means acknowledging the divinity and unique revelation of Jesus Christ, the sanctity of human life, the truth that marriage is only between a man and a woman, understanding motherhood as a gift, and acknowledging the authority of fatherhood. The United Nations and socialist and or commie elite global leaders cannot restore or elevate society because they lack these fundamental moral and theological truths. The United Nations and other such organizations are not our father, and we are not their children. They want to usurp this role from God, but their attempts to create a better society and reset things is a deception and fundamentally flawed because their vision is worldly. The restoration and elevation of society to something truly better requires a good, holy, and loving father who defends those entrusted to his care, does battle with evil, and lays down his life for truth. A good father is able to restore order and end the chaos within his household because he has the authority and power to do so. No true and loving father creates a mess for his children. Failed fatherhood is largely why we are in the predicament and moral degradation we find ourselves in today. 
This is why God is drawing our attention to St. Joseph and telling us that now is the time of St. Joseph. Without St. Joseph, we are not going to build back better anything. Until families have sacrificial and virtuous fathers and dioceses and parishes have holy and heroic bishops and priests pattern off of the virtuous and sacrificial fatherhood of St. Joseph, any attempt to build back better will remain bereft of moral authority and orderly theological foundations. What the world needs to be restored and elevated is something, is, to something better is the Holy Trinity, the earthly trinity of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and holy families. All other attempts to remake or reset society are a deception. Now, why am I saying that and saying it so strongly? Because we're living in a time, brothers, you've, you, you see what's going on in society, in the world. There's something afoot. There is an unholy spirit at work that is up to something. And we're all being kind of recipients of it at, at the moment. Many of you, I mean, it's one reason why we can't even have, you know, our normal functioning in a church. Because secular leaders are telling us what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what to wear, and when. How many people you can be with? Now, yeah, we have to take precautions to some of these things. We're not reckless, right? But there are some things that are going on that are unprecedented in your lifetime, in my lifetime, for sure. None of us were around when the Spanish flu, you know, was going down. We've got this situation right now that's just one of many on the planet. Those of us here in the United States, we've had an election year, and it's been crazy, nuts, what's going on. There's so much chaos that right now, what's, what's one of the main reasons that we're experiencing the chaos that we're experiencing today? Because there's a ton of reasons, for sure. One of them, as I alluded to in that little segment that I wrote that I put on my phone, is a broken, wounded fatherhood. It's ex been experienced everywhere. I mean, look at, look at today in marriages. Did you know that 52% that of all marriages today end in divorce? That's over half. Most times, not always, but most times, uh, it's, it's, it's not the woman who wants to get the divorce. Most times, it's the man. Because we've been, we've been so warped in our understanding of sacrificial manhood. When some little cute little thing comes along in the workplace and your wife, gravity's got your wife and things go south, what do us flawed men sometimes do? Stupid things. We forget our responsibility. And we go off and we throw our manhood away, our fatherhood away. I take no delight in saying this or pleasure in saying this by no means. But think about the church, the household of God. You know as well as I do that within the last 50, 60 years or so, things have been an absolute mess. And what's one of the major reasons for this? Flawed fatherhood. Broken, wounded fatherhood. With the scandals that we've seen. It's been everywhere. Can't deny it. Oh, the media blows it out of proportion, of course, but it is there. It's happened. I was ordained a priest in 2003 when all of it happened, and I was ordained in Massachusetts. Oh, that's where it all broke loose. These times, my brothers, are serious times. And we're seeing now that society, and certainly the evil one, is taking advantage of this brokenness, of this woundedness, of the division. As a matter of fact, today... We've, we seem to be even living out prophecies which have been, on some level, you could say approved. Like Our Lady of Akita, her message in 1973 in Japan, an approved apparition, where she talks about bishops being against bishops, priests being against priests, so that one bishop will say one thing and another will say something the opposite. Same thing with priests. What is that all about? That's not normal. So we're living in this time of so much confusion and brokenness and woundedness, and one of the major reasons is because the devil has been attacking fatherhood in a huge way. 
Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You don't want to embarrass yourself. But if I did, and I said, raise your hand if you have uh, been affected by the poison more serious than the coronavirus, more deadly to your soul of pornography, I guarantee you that almost every one of you, if not every one of you, would raise your hand. It will find you today. It is a poison, a filth, a sickness that is plaguing humanity right now, destroying the integrity of men, their purity, their virtue, and messing up families, even messing up priests. It happens. It's shameful. Brothers, how do we get out of this? How do we go about doing a great reset in a godly way? How do we restore and elevate society, getting back to common sense, the basics, in an era in which today people think that it's okay for two men to marry each other or two women to marry each other? Or, you know, you can marry a dolphin today. Not making that up. Not making that up. You can identify as anything that you want. Where are the men who have said to their family, not in my house, not in my house? See, the pro part of the problem today is that many men are actually scared to say the truth because now, on many, in many ways, government can come in and actually threaten to take away your children. You know, this just happened, was it in Australia or England, just the other day. A mom and a dad, God bless them, refused to allow one of their children to start taking hormones to, you know, go the other way. No. What did the government do? They came in and took the child away, saying that this was a form of abuse. What madness is this? This is the crazy times that we're living in. How in the world are we going to recover lost ground? Because we've, we've lost ground, guys, in a huge way. Many men don't even know what it means to be a man today. They don't. They, they haven't been given a, a holy, virtuous example. And, and m many times it, it turns into something that is, is far from being holy and godly. How do we get this back? Well, my friends, about four years ago, in my priesthood, hearing a lot of confessions and talking to a lot of people and going to a lot of men's conferences, I had so many people coming up to me saying, Father, what do we do? How do we return to these things? How do, how do we get back to order within our diocese, within our parishes, within our families, within society? How do we get back? It's a good question. How do we do it? Do we look to the latest sports figure? Do we wear his jersey because he's going to be the one to help elevate society? No. No. You don't even know these people. You have no idea. And half the times they will let you down. They will take a knee for things they should not be taking a knee for. It's not real manhood. So where do we look? To the actors? To the musicians? The singers? Nope. Where do we look? Imagine if you were, were, were an engineer or, or, or an architect and you see that there's a bridge or, or some kind of structure that is collapsing. It's falling apart. Wouldn't you want to go to the blueprint to see how this thing is shored up, how it was put together? Because we've got to, we've got to re go in, we've got to reset, we've got to, to, to redo some things here so that it doesn't collapse. That makes a lot of sense. But a lot of people don't do that. They go to all the flawed models, all the broken bridges. Let's be like that. Not going to work. So then where do we go? There is a man appointed by God to be the very father, the virginal father of Jesus Christ. There is a man who was given a mission to be the most chaste, loving, sacrificial husband to the most beautiful woman who ever was. There is a man who has a title called the Terror of Demons. It's the great St. Joseph. My brothers, now is the time of St. Joseph. We have never needed him more in the world 
and in the church than right now. And unless we bring him in to our diocese, parishes, families, we are not going to reset anything. We're going to go down a worse path. And that's what part of my fear is today. Is that what is what so many leaders in world governments are seeking to do, but they're doing it the wrong way. They're looking at all the flawed models. And many of them, their intentions are not good. Now, I'm not some anti-vaxxer, right? But a lot of these people promoting the vaccine right now? <laughs> mm, I don't know, buddy. You're kind of sketchy. And your morality is jacked up. And the people that are funding these things, so many of them are anti-Christian, anti-cross, anti-wisdom, anti-family, anti-everything good, true, and beautiful. I don't trust you. As I said, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. You know, I got the polio vaccine when I was a kid. Another one is to birth, whatever it was. You know, great, praise God, you know. But, mmm, 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 some sketchy stuff. And yet you can have today, like I said a few minutes ago, some bishops will say, yay, take it as soon as it comes out. Wait a minute. And then other bishops say, oh, no, we got to look into what's in it, make sure there's no fetal tissue, that it's not, you know, crazy stuff changing your DNA, uh, you know, because we got technology now. We can really make you into something else. <laughs> so who do we look to? This is, this is a crazy time. This is why we have got to look to St. Joseph to help us, to lead us, to guide us so that we don't go off. Because the devil is just waiting, just waiting to make things even worse than what they currently are. Now, I don't want to freak you out. I don't want to send you in a panic. But you're aware of this. The times that you watch TV, you see what's going on. We've got to get back. We've got to return to moral order. And the only way that we're going to do that, because the attacks right now are on the family, we've got to go to the head of the Holy Family. You know, Sister Lucia dos Santos, she was the visionary from Fatima who lived like super long. I, I think she might have lived to be like 100. She only died, uh, I think it was in 2005. She said on one occasion, this is a visionary, saw the Blessed Virgin, saw our Lord, saw St. Joseph even. She said that the final battle between good and evil would be fought over marriage and family. Wow. She said that, I think, in 1925, after the Fatima apparitions, when she was a nun in Spain. We're, it's 2020 now? This is being played out in country after country. And this is why I believe, four years ago, when I was at prayer and talking to so many people, I believe the Holy Spirit put upon my heart that we need to Return to this special man to look to him to know how to get out of this situation. But I didn't know fully what that meant. Okay, great. So we increase our devotion to St. Joseph and we ask his intercession and we, you know, obviously start to imitate him and, and, and learn to turn away from the filth and, and, and the things that are corrupting us. But what, what else? I mean, is, is there something more that we can do here? I mean, you know, there's got to be some kind of program or something that, that men can take up in, in men's groups, in, in the Knights of Columbus, or, or on, a, on a huge level. And that's when I went to prayer. And I was asking the Holy Spirit, I'm feeling this. I'm, I'm feeling that this is the time because I started to do some, some research and I, I realized, you know, the church has never really emphasized in a huge way St. Joseph. Because in a certain sense, in a certain sense, in ages past, we kind of didn't need to on some level. Don't get me wrong there. There were saints who would, great ones, who would emphasize him at a particular era, you know, when like St. Teresa of Avila, she wanted to reform the Carmelites. So she turned to St. Joseph and named all of her reformed uh, convents after St. Joseph and, and many others who turned to him. But there was never something like on a huge grand scale because certain things back then weren't under attack like they're under attack today, like marriage and, and babies. I mean, in the 13th century, uh, you know, abortion was not really that much of an issue like it is today. Or marriage. 13th century, if some, some two men came up to a priest and said, we want to get married, <laughs> 
please, right? But today, everything is up for grabs. Everything. Everything is being redefined and put into law. Now is this time when we need this special man who was given a unique mission. Can you imagine the role that he played to be the, we say, foster father of the God-man? To be the husband of the most beautiful woman? The holiness, the virtue, the, the sanctity, the, the depth of the interior life. And so as I went to unpack this, I went back and I, and I had my own questions. Who are you, St. Joseph? I mean, I pray to you, but I can't say that I really think that I know you. And I remembered a, a, a phrase from St. Maximian Kolbe. He said it during his lifetime, even after the church had defined Marian doctrines and dogmas and there were apparitions and there was, you know, Our Lady, the core of Christianity, St. Maximian Kolbe a hundred years ago said this, Who are you? O Immaculata, who are you? O Immaculate Conception. And he started an apostolate to unpack that, the Militia Immaculata, an army of Our Lady, basically, to, to, to spread Marian consecration, spread the rosary, the, the miraculous medal, and uh, you know, a, a printing press, and all this other great stuff. So I asked myself some, a similar question. Who are you, St. Joseph? Who are you? Because when I see you, in artwork, you know, some of it very old artwork, are you really like a 90-year-old dude? Because most images that I've seen to you, I don't know too many men who would look at an old man with a lily and say, sign me up. I want to be like that. Hmm, is that really you? I've actually heard on occasion, sometimes from even priests and homilies, I've heard you were a widow that you were married before you were espoused to the Blessed Virgin, and you even had other children from a previous marriage. Is this true? Does the church teach that you were an old, decrepit man about to die? Does the Catholic Church teach that you were a widow with children from a previous marriage? I didn't know. I was a priest. So I said, all right, who are you? So I began this quest to unpack who is St. Joseph, and I discovered the Catholic Church has never taught that he was an old man. That is not the teaching of the Catholic Church. Nope. Catholic Church has never taught that he was a widow and had children from a previous marriage. That is not the teaching of the Catholic Church. It doesn't matter who, what bishop says so. It ain't true. Never been the teaching of the Catholic Church. Fascinating. What else don't I know? So I went right to the fathers of the church and I started reading stuff. And then I realized that the intention for, for saying these things about St. Joseph was noble and good. But they, many people were just kind of fudging it, creating legends about him to protect the virginity of Mary. Okay, good. Yes, she's a perpetual virgin. We need to protect that, to honor that. But you don't have to show and make up stories that St. Joseph was a 90-year-old man when he married her to show that. Matter of fact, it's actually more virtuous for a younger man. Not that he was necessarily her age. He probably was older than her, but not like three times older. It would be more virtuous for him to have been younger to practice chastity and purity of heart and his eyes, his intentions. And then I found great quotes from like St. Jose Maria Escrivá and Venerable Fulton Sheen, who nailed this issue. I was like, ah, brilliant. That makes so much sense. And especially for a time that we're living in, where so many men, their hearts are going astray through impurity, especially, we need this presentation of the great St. Joseph. To be heroic in, 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 in watching our, our passions, our motives, our intentions, our desires. Because there is flesh out there put in our face every day. And we are naturally drawn to it as men. We have to be disciplined. We have to know what is ours and what is not ours. St. Joseph is such a model of this. Such a holy, pure man. And I discovered so many other things that I, I gathered so much information about apparitions of St. Joseph. Did you know that there have been apparitions of St. Joseph? Approved apparitions. And almost nobody knows about this. We always hear about Our Lady, of course, 
And of course, Our Lady is greater than St. Joseph. We know this. She's the Immaculate Conception, Mother of God, Theotokos, the God-bearer. She's the Mediatrix of all grace. St. Joseph is not any of those things. But at a time when there's such a crisis, we now need to bring in to our baptismal consecration to Jesus Christ, which is our primary consecration, because He is God. We need to bring into our devotional consecrations to our spiritual mother, the Queen of Heaven and Earth, Our Lady. We need to close the gap and bring in the great Saint Joseph, the head of the Holy Family. Now is the time for this. Turning to Him, and I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to, we can reset things in the right way. We can look to what it means to be a man, what it means to be a father, what it means to be sacrificial, what it means to be loving, humble, patient, silent, a good worker, you name it. And then I discovered that the Holy Spirit has been doing something, anticipating, because God is he's the maker of time, He knows everything. Knowing what the 20th century would be, and now the 21st century, eight. 1870, the Pope at that time, a great Pope, blessed Pope Pius IX, declared St. Joseph in 1870 the patron of the universal church. Why did it take so long to do this? Because the Holy Spirit knew that we were going to need St. Joseph in our time more so than any other previous time. Many saints and mystics have actually even prophesied that there would be a forthcoming era of St. Joseph. A time of St. Joseph when the church, and these are ancient prophecies. The first one, I believe, was from a Dominican priest in the 16th century, Father Isidore de Isolanis, who said that the church in the future would be going through a very difficult time, unlike any other time. But when the church turned to St. Joseph, and acknowledged his, his dignity, his roles, and his importance, we would experience a tremendous victory over the darkness. And there were others that are lesser known. If you're a theologian, many people have heard of Father Isidore de Isolanis, but some people have not heard about Saint Jose Mañanet in the 19th century in Spain, a great saint who talked about the same thing, that there's an era of Saint Joseph coming for the church or Blessed Petra of St. Joseph, another great holy person in the church, also from Spain, who have talked about this. Well, in 1870, the Pope declared St. Joseph the patron of the universal church. Why? Why? Because that was the same time and the same Pope where we got the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. That's when the family, in a particular way, began to be attacked. It's when contraceptives were created to attack the family. In that same time frame, synthetic rubber was created to create, you name it, rubbers. Really? The devil is a strategist, a demonic intelligence who knows how to go after things in a certain way. Tricky, deceitful, cunning. And so our church, we, we get the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. We get the proclamation of St. Joseph as the patron of the universal church. The word patron comes from pater which means father. No other saint has that. St. Francis of Assisi is not the patron of the universal church. St. Dominic, St. Ignatius, St. Augustine, none of them. Only St. Joseph has this role. And after the Pope declared that, you wouldn't believe the snowball effect that began in the church of emphasizing St. Joseph, and it's been going down this hill building mass and getting to what it is now. Let me read to you some of these things. These are the things that I discovered that the Holy Spirit has been doing almost behind the scenes, but now we need to know about it and we need to take it into our lives. I'm going to read to you a few things that I discovered. I'm not going to read them all because we'd be here a while, but they're all in this book, by the way, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So in 1870, the Pope declares him the patron of the, of the Universal Church. In 1871, the Josephites are founded, a religious community dedicated to St. Joseph. 1873, the Congregation of St. Joseph is founded. 1878, the Oblates of St. Joseph are founded. Religious communities begin to sprout up everywhere. 1879, what do we get? Heaven responds to what the Pope did by sending St. Joseph in an apparition. 
Nine years after the Pope made that declaration, where was it? Knock Ireland. Right? You know it. You probably have heard Our Lady of Knock. Yes, of course. Our Lady always gets priority. But St. Joseph was there as well. No words were said. Kind of classic St. Joseph. Nobody said anything. They didn't need to. They were going through a difficult time in Ireland. There was a famine. People were leaving, coming to the United States to find work. They were seriously suffering. The mere presence of St. Joseph and Our Lady, and there was a lamb depicting our Lord as the Lamb of God, and St. John the Evangelist gave comfort to the people. That's a fully approved apparition, Our Lady of Knock. After that, we get the first encyclical on St. Joseph by another great pope, Pope Leo XIII. It was written in 1889. What the heck? It took 1,889 years to get an official document on St. Joseph? Yep. Yep. Wow. That's amazing to think about that. After that, we get this blessed Petra of St. Joseph. I wish I could tell you more about her. She, she builds a shrine to St. Joseph in Spain. Extraordinary. St. John Paul II called her the Apostle of St. Joseph of the 19th century. After her, we get St. Andre Bessette who would be the apostle of St. Joseph of the 20th century. A, a brother, a man who never became a priest up in Canada and began construction on the world's largest church dedicated to St. Joseph in Montreal, the Oratory of St. Joseph. Just our northern neighbors have this in Canada. It's extraordinary. I've been there many times and it's, it's an amazing place. After that, we get churches in Rome dedicated to St. Joseph. Again, what the heck? We didn't have churches in Rome dedicated to St. Joseph until the beginning of the 20th century. That's, a, that's almost embarrassing to think about. After that, we get the Litany of St. Joseph approved by the church in 1909. 1909! 1914, we get the pious union of St. Joseph founded. And then we get another apparition of St. Joseph. You know where that one was? Fatima, Portugal. Again, we know it as Our Lady of Fatima, and rightly so. But she's not the only one who came. All three visionaries testify that St. Joseph was there at the famous apparition, the last one, October 13th, where the sun spun and like 70,000 people saw it gyrating, thought the world was going to end, it was going to crash into the earth and Our Lady identified herself as the Lady of the Rosary, all three visionaries said that St. Joseph appeared to them in, in the sky, holding the Christ child, and simultaneously, Father and Son, Jesus and Joseph, blessed the world. Wow. That is, that is a huge thing, and it's almost a forgotten aspect of the Fatima apparitions. Fatima was telling us about the importance of the family and the authority and the headship of the father. See, today, people are so politically correct, they're offended by this language. Oh, the head of the family, I don't like that. It's because you don't know what it means. Everybody is so, you know, triggered today by this kind of language that they're offended by everything. It's funny to me, though. Who said this to me recently? Father Mitch Pacwa, great, great priest. He said, isn't it interesting that the people um, who are against gun laws are always the ones getting triggered? <laughs> anyway, yeah, he's right. He's right. He's got a lot of guns, by the way, <laughs> Father Mitch Pacwa. He's a great guy. So, and then we get in 1921, blessed be St. Joseph put into the divine praises. We say those like when we have benediction. Then we get the first journal dedicated to St. Joseph. Then we get um, more alleged apparitions of St. Joseph. These have not been condemned. Um, it's for private devotion, but it's called Our Lady of America. But certain bishops earlier this year wrote a document on it saying they didn't want it promoted publicly, which is a little odd to me, but nonetheless, we obey them. But it can be promoted privately. And there's some extraordinary things mentioned in these, in these alleged apparitions. And then we get... In the mid-20th century, because of the threat of communism, who did the church turn to to help overcome the threat of communism? St. Joseph. The Pope declared May 1st the feast of St. Joseph the Worker because communists wanted to turn their understanding of, of, of work and, and everything, society, family, in their direction. So the church changed it and said, nope, not going to happen. And it was shortly after that, uh, that we did see, on some level, the defeat of communism. Now it's coming back under different names. You can call it Marxism or socialism. It's coming back strong because the young people don't know what the heck they're talking about. 
So many of the institutions today are brainwashing your sons and daughters, uh, telling them that these are good things. Really? Go to Venezuela. Ask them how that's worked out. Go to Cuba. Ask them how that's worked out for them. Socialism. Oh, it looks nice. Everything will be taken care of. You won't own anything, but everything will be given to you. Kind of like a slave, huh? Yeah, kind of like a slave. But the young people are super into it today. Yay, socialism, they say. Clueless, because they're being indoctrinated by these professors. You know, we, we talk about, you know, defunding the police. Well, how stupid is that, right? We should be defunding universities is what we should be doing, because these are the places that are brainwashing the generation. Now, I take no delight in saying that, but it's the obvious stinking truth. And everybody's, oh, we don't want to say that. We'll offend people. Offend them, right? Somebody needs to say the truth. So after that, we get the insertion of St. Joseph's name into the Mass. <laughs> what? Yep. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until 1962 that Joseph's name appeared in the prayers of the Mass, the greatest of all prayers. Holy moly. Again, that's kind of embarrassing. But he's there now. Uh, in all four of the Eucharistic prayers that we have. Uh, his name is there now. And then we get another document on St. Joseph in 1989 by St. John Paul II. What's all this doing? The Holy Spirit is practically screaming at us, pay attention to Joseph. You're going to need him in extraordinary ways that I have saved this gift for your times. Saints of old, Many of them, they had such a great love for St. Joseph. But it was usually regional, you know, in Spain or, or, or in Malta. Malta's got an extraordinary love. Or, or Italy, of course. Or, you know, even certain South American countries like Colombia or Mexico. They, they have great love for St. Joseph. But it's never been on a grand scale. Here's something extraordinary to think about. You know, in the history of the church, we've had Marian years where the church as a whole or a particular diocese will honor Our Lady through particular uh, talks, conferences, pilgrimages within a diocese, indulgences are given, and it brings about great renewal, and many graces are given. We've had year of mercy, great. Year of prayer, wonderful. Year of consecrated life, awesome. We have never in 2,000 years of Christianity had a year of St. Joseph. We've never even had a pope named Joseph. We've never had Pope Joseph. I'm not talking about Joseph Ratzinger. I'm talking, that's, you know, no, I'm talking about their papal name. Never had one. Now, many people have said, well, maybe that's out of honor and respect. Maybe, okay, God bless them. But I think it'd be extraordinary to have something like that. I think if we had a pope, maybe named Joseph, may, may happen, it may not, but a pope who declared a year of St. Joseph for the entire church. This would bring to the attention of every parishioner, every man in those pews, every priest and every bishop, that we need to look to him. We need to turn to him right now. We need to ask for his intercession and his protection and his guidance, and we need to be like him. Because we have jacked this thing up. And unless we do this, we're not, it's not going to get better. You can do every form of so good social work that you want to, but it's very important to remember the Catholic Church is not primarily a social service agency. Jesus himself said, the poor you will always have with you, me you will not. That doesn't mean that we don't seek to eliminate poverty. We do our best. No, there is no organization on the planet on a daily basis more charitable than the Catholic Church. This is a proven fact. Even our enemies say this. But that's not actually what we're all about. What are we all about? Saving souls. That's what the Catholic Church is primarily about. I did not become a priest to be a celibate social worker. I would be an idiot if I did this. I became a priest to save souls. In all likelihood, I am not going to eliminate poverty. The God-man himself walked this planet 2,000 years ago and did not eliminate poverty. We should strive to do our best. But we have not here a lasting kingdom. You, as men, will have souls entrusted to your care that you must help get to heaven. Your wife, that's what your marriage is all about. 
You have to strive to help each other get to heaven. Your children, when they're under your care and under your roof, you lay down the rules. It doesn't matter what the teacher tells them at school. You don't do this in my house. Where has this gone? It's gone out the window lately. And this, so many fathers have been absent fathers, workaholics, or off just doing their own thing. Not good. We've got to get back to this. We've got to return to order. And you are the ones to do it. Women have their place, for sure. They are the heart of the home. Many, many saints have talked about, you know, the, the church is the mystical body of Christ, St. Paul, of course, and many others. Every home has a heart. That's the woman. That's the mother. No body lives without a heart. But no body lives without a head either. And that's your role. It doesn't mean that you're greater than your wife. Probably you're not. That's not the point, men. Remember, the, the majority of, of, of people at the foot of the cross were not men. They were women. Women do tend to be more compassionate, understanding, and on many levels virtuous than us. It's just the way that it is for some reason. But you have a role to play, a headship, a mission to fulfill. So did St. Joseph. Here's a man whose son, not biological son, of course, we know this, whose son, Jesus Christ, is God, whose wife is the Immaculata. And yet, who led the prayers in the family? It wasn't Jesus, and it wasn't Mary. It was the husband and the father of that household. He was the head of that household. And they weren't offended by this. Jesus didn't say, hey, what are you doing? I'm God, I can do it better than you. No. It is right for you to do it. I made you. I know how it all works. But I submit to your authority, given by God, which means given by me, if you were Jesus. It's your role. Mary, too, surrendered. You think she couldn't pray? Are you kidding me? She's the spouse of the Holy Spirit as well. But they let him fulfill his role. And he did it. He didn't cower from it. He could have said, well, my wife is better at it. I'll let her do it. I'll let her lead the prayers. I'll, I'll let her take us to, you know, wake us up in the morning and, and take us to the synagogue or, or to, to walk down to Jerusalem. She'll, she'll remind us on a calendar basis of when this needs to happen. Mm -mm. Joseph did. And the question is, what about you? Is this what you're doing? Or are you giving the, the spiritual religious practices in your family for your wife to do? She probably does do it better than you. That's not the point. You have a role to play. And when you fulfill that role like St. Joseph did, although in the Holy Family, every member is perfect, right? But when you do this in your family, the power of that leadership, that sacrificial leadership, that servant leadership will be tremendous. Studies have shown that when it's only left up to the mother or to the wife to be the one who does the practices, the religious observance in the family, when the children leave from that house, I think it's something like three-fourths of them, 75%, will not continue with those practices. Because it's just what mom did. It was just what mom did. But when the head of the family does it, it goes up exponentially. That they will continue to practice the faith. This isn't just Father Calloway saying this. Sociological studies have been done on this that show it to be the case. So you need to be the one doing it. If your children see you who have strength, chances are, God willing, you're stronger than your wife. Nowadays, you never know, you know. But hopefully you can swing an axe better than your wife. You know, you, you've got more physical strength than your wife. Your children know that. But when your children can see you in your strength, in your manliness, caressing their mother with a gentle caress, calling her sweet terms of affection, when they see you on your knees in prayer, that is strength. When they see you leading the rosary, when they see you waking the family up on Sunday to go to church when you're the one having the family go to confession. 
That example is tremendous. The power of that can transform family society. That's the great reset. That's how you build back better. You bring back real fatherhood, real manhood. And that's why we need St. Joseph today. As I was praying about how to give this to the world, you know, I, I needed something. I, I just couldn't start preaching on, everybody turn to Joseph and imitate Joseph. Have a nice day. <laughs> what can I give? What can I give people? So in my prayer, I said to myself, basically, you know, it'd be great if we had something comparable, analogous to a St. Louis de Montfort type of consecration, but to Joseph. Not a competition. Mary is greater than Joseph. And to understand it in the right way, because some people might think, well, wait, I've already consecrated myself to Mary. How could I give myself to Joseph? Well, it's actually a no-brainer. You're not children of a one-parent spiritual family, right? Imagine Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. When they found him in the temple, yeah, he wasn't lost. He knew what he was doing, but they lost him, right? When they found him, what does it say? He grew in wisdom and stature in his, in his manhood, in his growth, as a, is, in his human nature, not his divinity, of course. He grew in wisdom and stature under the watchful care of Mary and Joseph. Not just Mary. Because a boy needs a father. Even the God boy, <laughs> you know, needs him. Matter of fact, this is so profound that when God wants to look like somebody, when he takes on human nature, he only has the resemblance in his countenance of one person. That's Our Lady. Uh, Jesus probably had similar cheekbones, eye sockets or something to our lady. Just like you look like your mother on some level. I look like mine, certainly, when I'm clean shaven anyway. Right? It's just how it works. Biologically, it's a no-brainer. But Joseph? Jesus doesn't look like Joseph because he's not his biological father. But when you see Jesus, you're seeing Joseph on some level. How? Because he has the mannerisms of his father. He has the accent. He spoke like his father. He probably walked like his father. He swung an axe like his dad because that's the things that a father teaches his son. When you have a virtuous father in your life, it'll transform you. You know the axiom, like father, like son. That's why we have so many jacked up sons today, myself included, because our fathers have been poor examples. Spiritual fathers, priests, and our biological fathers. So if we look to St. Joseph, we can, we can unpack things. And so I said to people around the world, because I know a lot of people, I said, look, I've got this idea. I really think it's Holy Spirit inspired that can really help us to turn things around. Do you guys in Poland or in Mexico or the Philippines, I know you guys are pretty awesome. Do you guys have a book written by somebody, maybe a priest, maybe a layman, uh, that's like a St. Louis de Montfort type of consecration, but to St. Joseph, so that we can bring him into this whole crisis that we got going on with families. Categorically, everybody said no. Father, we, nobody's written a book like that. It doesn't exist. But they all said, that's a really good idea. We could super use that right now. So I knew what I had to do. So I spent the next three years of my life Remember, that was four years ago when I got that inspiration, doing the research, traveling around the world, gathering all this stuff to put it into some kind of formula to give to people, where you can do a program, 33 days. St. Louis de Montfort came up with that method in his Marian consecration. I thought, that's great. Why reinvent the wheel? But what's the template? What's, what's the skeleton that I put all the meat of who St. Joseph is on? I was praying the litany of St. Joseph every day. Powerful prayer, my friends. Powerful prayer. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it, and I'm going, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm like, there's almost 33 titles. Perfect. I'll have an introduction. We'll unpack a title a day as we go through the days, and I'll add stuff onto that, and then we'll do the consecration. And this is why I believe that you need this for, for, for your spiritual life and for your particular role. No matter what your vocation is, whether you're married, single, want to get married, whatever it is, because you're going to learn about titles like this. The chaste guardian of the virgin. See, we know that 
St. Joseph and Our Lady never engaged in marital relations. It was a, 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 what they call a Josephite marriage for the sake of the mission. Well, you, that's not going to be the case, of course, if you're married, unless it's some special gift from, from heaven for you, but it's very rare. But nonetheless, how do you treat your wife? You are blessed to be able to engage in marital relations, to, to, to engage in the marital act with your wife. Praise the Lord. It's a gift from God. But do you do it right? Or do you abuse your wife's body for your own pleasure? Do you put things inside her where they should not be? See, a lot of people today think, well, I'm married. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want with my wife's body. No, you can't. You're not an animal. You're not a dog. Nope. You have to respect the dignity, the sanctity of your wife's body. There are things in your body that should not go in certain parts of her body. See, this men don't like to hear today because men have been watching porn and they think it's okay and they want to try it. They want to experiment. How do I know? I hear confessions. I can't tell you the content, of course. I'd lose my priesthood. But it's true, and you know it's true. We need to become chaste. Even within your marriage, you have to be chaste. Even though you will engage in marital relations with your wife. As I said, it's a blessing from God. It's a wonderful gift. It's how babies are born. But nonetheless, you have to be chaste. You are not an animal. We learn about titles. The zealous defender of Christ. Are you a zealous defender of Christ? Or are you a spiritual pansy? So many men are today. Weak and spiritually impotent. Why? Primarily because you're impure. Satan does not fear the impure man. You have no power. If you are giving your life over to pornography and sins of the flesh, yes, we're all weak. That's, thank God for confession, right? But if this is who you are and what you do, you're going to be weak. You're not going to be able to fight against the darkness. You're not going to be able to slay dragons. You're not even going to want to take up a sword, the rosary, which we just prayed before this. No man slays a dragon without a sword. I know I'm cutting to many of your hearts right now, and it's good. We all need to hear this, myself included, because I'm a man just like you. Growing up in a filthy, perverse, sick, twisted, deranged time. A time of darkness and death. And we all need to hear this message. All of us. Joseph. The model of workmen. He wasn't a workaholic. He wasn't. There was a time for work and a time not to work. A time to be with your wife and children and be with them at the, at the moment, in the moment, doing things with them. can't tell you how many times I meet men who find their identity in their work or their salary or their this, that, and the other. You know, it's not there, guys. You're not going to find it there. The best thing that you could have on your, your tombstone, he was a damn good man, a good father, a good husband. You couldn't ask for a better husband. Not about your job best trophy you could ever get is to raise up sons and daughters who are holy, who are close to Jesus Christ. That's the best thing that you can do. Is it easy? Of course not. It's extremely hard, especially in the times we're living in. But it's what God is asking you to do. The glory of domestic life. Wow. How many of you, this is a challenge, and you know, even to myself, you know, if your children were at school and they had a little show and tell, let's say, and the teacher said, all right, next week, bring in a picture of your dad and describe him to the class. How many of your children would go before the class and say, my dad is the glory of domestic life? They might not even know those words, but let's just say, right? Would they? Or would they say, ah, my dad's gone all the time, he yells at my mom, and basically he just drinks beer all day and watches, you know, football? Would they? What would they say about you? Be interesting to know, right? 
Pillar of families. These are all the titles of St. Joseph from the litany that you unpack in this book. Pillar of families. A pillar is a foundation, guys. If you don't have a pillar, everything collapses. This is why we're seeing the collapse, basically, of civilization. Because men have not been pillars. They've been abusers of the feminine mystery, chasing after money and various other things. This is why we got to get back to the fundamentals. Or, and this is my favorite one, I think when most men hear it, it's their favorite too, the mighty terror of demons. This is the most unique title of St. Joseph. It's the money title. Bring in the big guns. It's, I commissioned artwork for the book, which you'll find in the book and on the website, to give us new images of St. Joseph that, yes, show him holding the lily because that represents purity, which we all need, but to show him as a man that when the devil sees him, terrified. And why is that? We know why the devil is terrified of Our Lady, right? She's, it's her dainty little feminine foot that crushes his ugly satanic face. We know that. It's in the book. You know, it's in the Bible. Well, what about St. Joseph? Well, think about this. There's only two people who can talk to God in this way. Jesus, God. If I said this, call the bishop. I need to go to priest camp. I, I need to be reprogrammed because I've lost my, my mind. If I said, Jesus, my Savior and my Son, and he ain't my son. He's not your son either. But he is the son of Mary and Joseph. So when Jesus hears those words, things change. They have no wine, Our Lady says. Boom, you got wine. A lot of wine. When Jesus hears Joseph ask something, he almost takes it like a paternal command. Yes, Father. Because he's always, like Our Lady, is in accord with God's holy will. This is what the devil does not want us to know. That's why he's terrified of St. Joseph. And I think on some level that the devil has been happy, so to speak. Now, that's not the right word, but you know what I'm getting at. That people have not been turning to St. Joseph. Because once we unleash the big guns on the battlefield, it's over. He is going to help us restore things in our church, as wounded and messed up as it is right now. And it is. He is going to help restore things in our parishes, in our families, in our own brokenness. Look, most of you have jacked it up. I have too. If you know my conversion story, you know before I became a Catholic, man, I was, I was wicked. Even now, I've been a priest 17 years. I am not perfect. I fall flat on my face on occasion. i got to go practically crawling into confession. Bless me, Father, I have sinned. It was yesterday. I'm an idiot. But I don't deny the truth. The truth is the truth. I have to conform to it. Father, forgive me again. I, 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 I fell again. The same stupid thing. Brothers, we're in this together. And we are being given an extraordinary grace that saints of old would have longed to have had a program of learning who we can look to, who we can model ourselves after, and how we can become better men and become holy men. And that's what this whole program is. And that's why I simply titled the book. I didn't want to come up with some title that was hard to remember. I just called it Consecration to St. Joseph. Can't get any more basic than that. And it leads you through this program. This thing only came out in January. The timing was perfect. I didn't know what was going to happen, neither did you. All I knew was that in 2020, as a matter of fact, in just a couple days, December 8th, 1870, was when the Pope had declared St. Joseph the patron of the church. 150 years ago, exactly on December 8th. So I said, hmm, let's get this puppy out for 2020 and we can, you know, help transform the world. I had no idea that there would be a pandemic, that people would lose their jobs, but God did. And that's why God is elevating right now the patron of workers, St. Joseph. Because so many men I talk to, they've got families, they just lost their job, or they're on furlough, things are in question. They're not sure what their financial security is for the future. Now is the time of St. Joseph on every level. And that's why I got bold. 
I got bold. I wrote the Pope a letter in English asking him to do something. And then one of my brother priests said, you know what, he doesn't know English. I said, yeah, that's true, right? So he translated it into churchy Spanish, you know, did it up real nice and gave it to the Pope, begging him to declare a year of St. Joseph for the whole church. We need to bring this to the attention. Whether people use my book or not, we need to get St. Joseph into churches. More masculine and younger statues of St. Joseph in our churches. That's what we need to look to, to want to be like a, a slayer of dragons, a defender of beauty, the good, the true, and the beautiful. That's what we need. Have I heard back from the Pope? No. Bummer. But you know what I did? I said, all right, we'll keep praying about that. I wrote every bishop in the United States and begged them to declare a year of St. Joseph for their diocese. Do you know what the response has been? Eleven dioceses have done it. Please ask Archbishop Sample. You have one of the best bishops in the country here. And I know they're busy and they're doing tons of other things and the, the, the coronavirus kind of messed up everything. But please, write Archbishop Sample and ask him. I did. You know, keep asking. Keep knocking, remember? Even if you've got to annoy people, keep asking because this will be extraordinary for, for the diocese here. It can help renew things. Now it's catching on. I'm hearing about other countries where the bishops are interested in doing it. There's two dioceses in England that have done it. I've heard about bishops in India, the Philippines, South Africa, who are praying about it and having meetings with their, their, their staff, their priest, to want to declare a year of St. Joseph. We need this for our times. Really and truly, we need this. As I said at the beginning, brothers, there is an unholy spirit in the air that is trying to usurp fatherhood and impose their own desire to reset things, to build back better. It's not the right way. We, as Catholic men, we have the truth in its fullness. We can do what needs to be done to restore things, to bring back that, that prayerfulness in families, to turn away from all the poison that is out there, Will this require sacrifice? Yes, it will. And it's not easy. I'll be the first to say, this is not easy to do. When you have to maintain custody of your eyes, when you have to discipline yourself in your mind, not to fantasize, go in directions it should not go, even your entertainment. See, today we, we, we men, we don't, we don't discipline in our house, we allow the children to watch anything and everything. How sick and twisted is it today when you can have people who think there's something called cuties? Have you heard about this? How sick and twisted to have little girls dressed up like prostitutes, basically, you know, twerking and tweaking and whatever, and nobody, people think it's fine, think it's normal. And I, I hear they're up for an Emmy or, or an Oscar. What madness is this? Where are the men? Where are the men? We are the ones who need to be able to, to give guidance and direction to, to say what is good and what is not good. And this will challenge you. That means that you are going to have to watch the things that you entertain yourself with. Because it's easy to watch so many filthy things that are funny. I won't deny. They're hilarious. But they're sick. They're twisted. I have to remind myself when I'm watching TV and all of a sudden I'm watching a sitcom and it's funny as all, get out. But it is messed up. Whether it's your modern families where we normalize the disordered and we laugh at it. When your children see you doing this, you've lost all moral authority. All of it. We need to get it back. So I'm going to challenge you, brothers. Now, because of the situation, normally I would ship books into a conference like this, but I didn't, because I, we didn't think anybody was going to be at it. I thought I was just going to be standing in front of a camera. So there's some of you. So I lugged 16 copies in my luggage. That's all I got, boys. That's all I got. Um, and I, if you don't buy them, I'm basically going to leave them in the hallway, because I about broke my arm carrying them here in airplanes across America. But if you can't get one today, get it. 
Get it on Amazon, whatever, and do this. Do this by yourself if you're not married. If you are married, do it with your wife, with your family. Ask your priest to do it for the parish. I know times are tough right now for the parish and so forth, but you can still, we become masters of Zoom meetings and such, right? We need to do this, guys. I believe that the Holy Spirit is offering you a challenge to be like Joseph. You know, Joseph means increase. That's what the name Joseph etymologically means. It means increase. Joseph, St. Joseph, is the increaser. He will increase your virtue. He will increase your relationship with Jesus and Mary. He will increase your holiness. And this is what the church and the world desperately need today. So my brothers, go to Joseph in your spiritual life, in your family life, and learn how to be a good, holy man. Because this is how we will bring about the greatest reset. The reset that God desires. This is how we will build back better by bringing in St. Joseph and correcting the wrongs of our times. God bless you, brothers. Thank you so much for listening to me. All right. So, um, start with the first one. How can we work to re-enthuse the men in our own parish and, and community? Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I answered some of that already. I think... Um, We've got to do it together, guys. What the devil wanted, wants to do is isolate you and get you away from brotherhood, that fellowship, and unaccountability. So if you have somebody that you can be close to, that's a good thing. I mean, even as a priest, I have a priest friend that I'm close to that I go to outside of confession as well. I go to him for confession, but also just to share my own struggles, you know, and talk about, bro, bro, I'm totally suffering right now, dude. I'm like feeling my anthropological manliness in a huge way. Pray, pray for me. Help me. You know, help me to you know, not fall into sin. I think we all need that today. I, I think that's a big thing. So, Father Calway, I have five kids all grown. None are in the church. How do we bring them back? Yes, I pray for it every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. My heart goes out to you. Um, as I said, I mean, you know, you can do what you can do, but the influences of the world can be super strong. Trust me, I live in Steubenville, Ohio. You can't get more Catholic. And yet, you know, you'll have homeschool families that on occasion, they'll say, Father, we did everything right. My son served at the Latin Mass. We, you know, our family's like, you know, pretty much the perfect family. And I'm like, yeah, I hear you. But then one of the kids goes off and is experimenting with drugs or finds a significant other in San Francisco or whatever. These are crazy times. The pull of the world is so strong. So if you're in that situation, I would say they're outside of your roof. Okay, but you need to pray fast if you can. Fasting is prayer squared. It's like prayer with a punch. Know your limits and what you can do. Don't kill yourself. But all those things, the devotional life, you got to keep it up. You got to keep it up. And you will suffer, Especially your wife. She'll suffer more than you. They, they're more sensitive than we. we. We just get preoccupied with things and we, we just, we, our mind goes somewhere else and we're just doing whatever. We go fishing or whatever. But a wife, they carry it hard. So you need to also be there for your wife because she's probably bearing a lot more of it in her sensitive heart than we are. How can we show how important the mission of masculinity is in protecting the family? Well, I mean, if we don't protect the family, we're totally screwed. I mean, this is the building block of civilization. If we don't protect this, and we're the ones who have the fullness of the truth, right? The United Nations ain't going to protect it. No way. The World Health Organization ain't going to protect it. You know, half of these people that, that want to promote things uh, for society, they're the ones who want to sterilize, you know, people so that we can have more babies, I mean, this is what we're up against. So we've got to be the ones who take a stand. It, it doesn't mean that you have to be the next Mother Teresa or Fulton Sheen. You've been given a particular little unit to protect and defend. Let, let everybody else worry about their stuff. You, you do what you need to do for your particular little flock, so to speak. Right? Don't become preoccupied with other things that are out of your control. You do what you have to do for those entrusted to your care. 
What would you say to the man that says, I'm a good Christian, but the church I go is uh, another Christian church. I'm not Catholic. That's good enough for me. Yeah, you're going to have a rough go at it, and Satan is going to kick your butt. Really. Seriously. Because you're not, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. So it don't matter how great the fellowship is and how great the singing is. Because ultimately, it actually ain't about the fellowship, though we need it. And it ain't about the music. Mm -mm. It's about sanctifying grace. These are not my words. Read the book. Right? All, all who claim to be not Catholic but are Christian love the Bible. Of course. It's our primary source of divine revelation. Well, read what's in it. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. Isn't it interesting that that's the only book in the New Testament that has 66 verses in a sixth chapter? Basically what I'm saying is 666. Do you know what it says in, in Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 66? And not understanding him, they walked away. When you walk away from the Eucharist, you've walked away from life. Really? Guys, I could have me a mega church in Texas next weekend, and I could be the best life coach you ever heard. I could have me some fine cufflinks and a smoking hot wife and a private jet, but I wouldn't be preaching the wisdom of the cross. I'd be preaching myself. It ain't about me. It's about Jesus Christ, the ultimate model of manhood who lays down his life, and he gave us a church, flawed, messed up, and as filled with crap as it is right now. Because it is. I'll give you an analogy. The Catholic Church is the only boat built by the Messiah. All the other ones are the attempts of men. They ain't going to make it. They're not. Just like the Ark of Noah, remember? There was one boat. God said, you build it. Everybody in it. The animals in it. You're alone going to make it. A lot of other people probably, as it, the flood was getting high, they probably tried to make their own. Like, holy crap, we better make a boat, you know? But it didn't work. If you weren't in that boat... You're not going to make it. That doesn't mean that when you're in that boat, that it's not going to be filled with tons of crap. There's tons of animals in it. It's deep. You're going to step in it. It stinks. But don't you jump out of that boat. Who do you think you are? That's the one boat that's going to get you to the shore in God's time. Yes, it stinks. There's filthy animals in it. But don't jump. Stick it out. You'll get there. See, that's what the Catholic Church is going through right now. Tons of animals in it. The crap is so high, it reeks the high heaven. But it's the only one made by Jesus Christ. All the others are the attempts of men. I know that sounds arrogant and rude, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And we shouldn't be ashamed to proclaim it. Do you have a YouTube channel or a way that we could hear your messages on a regular basis? I'm like the least tech guy on the planet, man. Bring back the Etch-a-Sketch, you know what I mean? I'm just, I'm so raw. I, I try these things and I mess it up and I get frustrated and I you know, throw the selfie stick down. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I put things up, you can check it out. I think it's called Father Donald Calloway. I don't think it's the most stellar thing to be honest with you. Um, just go to the website, that's where all my books are, so. I've read that we should consecrate ourselves to Mary prior to a consecration of St. Joseph. Could you comment on this, please? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it really doesn't matter because they're both your spiritual parents. But if you had to give priority to one or the other, yes, it would be Our Lady. Because she is greater than St. Joseph. She's the mother of God. I mean, she's the new Eve, the mother of all the living, the mediatrix of all grace. Um, she's the Immaculate Conception. So, yes, if you, if you were raw and you hadn't consecrated yourself to either one, sure. Go to our dear lady first. At this time of COVID isolation, how best can we keep a vibrant life moving to defend our families and therefore the world? Um, you know, the domestic church in the sense of don't, you know, you're, you're not called to social distance from God, right? So, or, or your, your, your religious observance. So maybe in your house, if you can, set up a chapel. Or, or an altar where you have the Bible, you have crucifix, you have some saints, you have your rosary, and you can make that a special place of prayer for your family to continue these practices. Because you don't want to just stop. 
And this is what worries me, is that now so many people have gotten used to Mass on TV, and they've actually heard people say, well, just make a spiritual communion. It's not the same, right? And so we need to do what we can in this time, but we need to remember, once this time is over, we actually do need to go back you know, to church. How can we enthuse our young adult sons in this time of confusion? That's tough because you're one person, uh, though the most important one for them in that leadership role, but that's what I mean by the power, the influence of the world, especially the education system, is so messed up. And the music and the, in, you know, the entertainment and all of that is so messed up that if they're not getting it from you, they're not going to get it at all. And so you, you've got to be the one not jamming it down their throats. And, and please don't take what I've said today, anything of it is like some super aggressive thing where you've just got to ram it down people's throats. No, you've got to be compassionate, merciful, kind, and all of that, without a doubt, without a doubt. But you've got to, you've got to draw the line. And you've got to do it in a way because automatically today, they're going to come back at you and say, you're a homophobe. You're, you're an Islamophobe. You don't love. No, son, that's not what I'm saying. I love you more than my life itself. I would die for you. But son, this is right and this is wrong. This is truth and this is false. This is light and this is darkness. Have I always lived up to it? No, I fall on my face. But there's right and wrong, son. And I love you. That's what they need to be told because, because if you don't, when they go through a crisis in life, which they will, they'll know, they'll, they won't know where to turn to where the truth never changes. It's just like I meet parents all the time who will say, well, we don't agree with our son's way of life. He's living with a significant other and they're going to get married. So, you know, we don't want to really, you know, make them think that we don't love them. So we're going to go to the wedding. Wrong. Wrong. You've just shown them that you have no morals whatsoever. You don't stand for anything. Even if they say, I hate you. I'm not talking to you. That will crush your heart, especially your wife's heart. But you need to stand your ground. Son, I love you. I'll give my life for you. But I'm not going to this because it's not a marriage. And they may not talk to you for many years. But when they go through their crisis, and they will, they, they will know where they can go back, where the truth doesn't change because of affection. So many people today, they, they choose a relationship or an affection, or they don't want to cause division or anything, and so they deny the truth. No bueno. That's a big part of why we're in the problem we're in today, because men cave. Don't cave. What's the role of recreational adventure in spiritual growth and a maturing of a man? Oh, it's huge. This is something that we've so gotten away from. And there's, there's nothing wrong with a man having a desk job or, you know, that's, no, of course not. But so many have allowed that to come into their wildness, right? There's a book, I recommend it and I don't recommend it because uh, he's not a Catholic and his wife actually says some really strange things, but it's called... Um, into the wild? No, not wild. into the wild. Wild at heart. Phenomenal stuff. Insights into manhood because we're born for this. We're born for, 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 for wildness and for battles and to def defend beauty and for brotherhood. That's why we gravitate towards sports and all that kind of stuff. But the world wants to strip that out of you. The world wants to emasculate you, wants to m take all of that out of you so that you're just soft and effeminate. Really. Now, I'm not saying that we need to walk around like, cavemen dragging our knuckles but we do need to be men who often get outside and do things in nature not tree hugging freaks but it's okay to go fishing and get blood on your hands from a worm and to gut a deer and kill a deer it's a good thing we've gotten away from this guys we've been turned into a bunch of pansies who are so soft that so many men today don't even know how to change a tire really if you're one of those, you're probably like, crap, that's me, right? Well, <laughs> YouTube, Google it. You'll find out. Learn manhood real quick. No, we've got to get back to these kind of things. And, 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 and I mean, in the past, right, in societies, cultures, civilizations, they would do these transition passages, a rite of passage for your son, where you'd go out and hunt a buffalo, right? And then you'd give him a name, you know, he who hunts buffalo, whatever, you know. 
we got to get back to some form of that kind of stuff in our families. Like, for example, I remember my biological father, when he died, right before he died, he gave me his gun. A really jacked up old, barely even works 22 with the scope that's, if I aim here, it, you know, horrible. But it was my dad giving me his 22 that I knew he had went, you know, hunting with. And I, I have it to the, I'm not going to get rid of that gun, right? Those kind of simple things I think we need to get back to on some level, on some level. How to help uh, guide our family to a consistent prayer life at home. Um, yeah, I probably answered that one already in the yeah, talk. You yeah. need to be leading. You need to be the one. And this will challenge you. We don't tend to want to do this because your wife is probably holier than you. And it's hard to do this. It's, I'll be honest with you. It can be humiliating because so many people have looked at the rosary like this is for weak little you know, pansies. No. The first person that the rosary was given to was a man, St. Dominic, right? So we've got to be the ones to do this for our families. This is actually heroic. And you won't have, in all likelihood, a daughter who grows up with daddy issues, who's crying out for affirmation, who ends up wearing dental floss, trying to get the attention of the boys because she knows her dignity and her worth because you were a father to her, a good father, a loving, affectionate, protective father, not overpowering, but showing her Basically, the old adage, although it can be twisted, she'll want to marry someone just like dad. Be like the, the man that you would want your daughter to marry. And then she'll look for him. But if you're not, she'll look for a twisted pervert who affirms her, but uses her and abuses her. Hmm, not good. How can we grow to ap appreciate... Um hardship and suffering in our lives that form the men we become. How can we teach that? By example. By example. You're going to be refined. You're going to be chiseled. And that's, that's part of the divine process. Uh, and again, uh, you know, it's not easy. And you're going to mess it up. But one of the greatest things that you can do by example, when you do mess it up, when you say something that you should not have, when you are caught doing something that you should not be doing, whatever it is, and your, your, your sons or daughters see that, you need to be humble. And you need to acknowledge you're wrong. And you need to go to confession. When they see that example, you're not only going to correct that example, it's going to be elevated. God is going to use your brokenness to bring about an even greater good. But so many of us, we're stubborn, stiff-necked, and we don't humble ourselves. And children, they, they need to see that. Daddy messed up. And you know what? I'm sorry, honey. I said something. I should not have said that. I am really sorry. Honey, let, you know, pray for your dad. I'm working. I want to be a saint, honey, but I, I got my own issues. You know? that, that, I think, will do tremendous good. What have you found to be the number one enticement for young men to true masculinity? Men. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. I mean, that's where you find it. When you, when you see, like, when I was growing up, even though I was completely jacked up in, in, in so many things, when I saw a, a, a good man, I wanted to be like that. Even though I, I, I found it difficult, you know, because of all the issues that I struggled with and the wounds that I had, we want to be like that. I mean, don't you, when you, when you watch, let's just say, like, Braveheart, don't you want to be Braveheart? Yeah, sure you do. When you watch, you know, something like that, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, when I would see Bruce Lee kicking butt to save some Asian princess, I'm like, I'd go outside and practice roundhouse kicks, <laughs> right? That's just the way it works. So when you see a man, and I'm not saying that these are models necessarily of manhood, but when you see a man who is virtuous, holy, and all of that, that's why we look to the saints. That's why we look to the saints. That's why me as a priest, I mean, I look at somebody like Fulton Sheen, and I'm like, I want to be like that. I may not have the cape and be able to do all the gestures today in these days, right? Or, or whatever. But I want to, mmm, that's like, mmm, <laughs> right? How can we share the understanding that holding the respect of a woman is a heroic act of masculinity? Well, I mean, without a doubt, it is. I mean, we, I think I covered that in the talk. I mean, we've got to do that. We've got to elevate them to, to the dignity of who they are. They are not goddesses, right? We're not incensing them. There are many women who would like that today. But we've we got to show with, by our respect and do things for them that past generations, they tell me, did. I didn't grow up in this era. But they tell me that when a woman walked in the room, men would stand up. Right? I've never known this. 
I've never grown up in this. And I think today, I mean, recovering something like that might be a little difficult unless we did it as a whole group. But if one man stood up, you'd be like, oh, okay, never mind. Um, but we can open doors for women. We can do kind things for women. They will love this stuff if you do this stuff for them. If you pull out their chair at the, at the, at the, at the restaurant. Are you kidding me? She's going to blush. Her heart is yours. We've got to recover this in society. Doing these simple things. Some women may not like it at first because I've actually... I've opened doors for women at like a Walmart and they're like, well, you think I can't open my own door? I'm like, whatever. You know, like, I didn't do it necessarily for you, honey. I did it because I want to be a man. Okay? We've, so we've got to return to some of these kind of practices. I think they would be very good. What would you say to those that are afraid to live their life publicly because they are afraid that they might lose a job, work opportunity, friends, or colleagues? Yeah, I understand. Uh, it's not easy, and it doesn't mean that you've got to go to work tomorrow and be like, in the name of the Father. No, okay, don't be stupid, right? But you can do certain things. Maybe clean up your language at work, okay? Certainly don't take the Lord's name in vain. If you're doing that, stop it, okay? But maybe you're doing other, dropping an F-bomb or an S-word here or there. Clean that stuff up as well. It may take some time. But by our, our example, or... Right? If people at work know that you're a, a married man, don't be talking about the backside of the secretary. Mm -mm, no. Okay, you may, you, be, you may be tempted to go there, but just like, no. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Right? Because that, stuff, that example, they're, they're going to look at you and think, oh, and you're a Catholic. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what Catholic men do. No, we can give you know, examples and, and such. And, um, but no, yes, you, you have a family, you don't want to lose your job unless you're being asked to do something explicitly immoral by your employer or something like that. But you can make little steps, little strides uh, to, um, to be a good example in the, in the workplace and, and come up with creative ways not to lose your job. Uh, and they will be creative. But remember, Jesus himself said, you've got to be, what is it, as, as, as cunning as serpents and as innocent as doves, right? So he's actually telling us, look, play the game. How big is the need for something like this men's conference today in, in our communities? Oh, it's huge because... As I said, we need each other. And the key thing from an event like this is don't let it just be like going to a ball game. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, it was great. This was great. Follow up. You got to follow up. Because if you just wait for this to come around once a year, what are you going to do the 364 other days of the year? You got to have that brotherhood, that fellowship, that accountability uh, together with other men. Doesn't mean it has to be a group setting, just maybe one or two where you have a real serious, um, you know, a, a, a brotherhood there. I, I, that is really important. What virtue is most important for us as men today? I mean, tons, but I would have to say purity. Really. And I say that just because I hear confessions, the numero uno sin among men is impurity. Whether it's pornography, masturbation, contraception, whatever. Oh my gracious, nothing else even comes close to this among men today. We've got to get back to having pure hearts. Remember, you want to see God? I do. Jesus said, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. If you ain't got a pure heart, you're blind, and you ain't going to see God. Therefore, we've got to strive for this. Though we mess it up, right? Thank God for confession. But this, in my opinion, is, is the big one today. How is speaking the hard truth still an act of love? Because it's a work of mercy. I mean, a lot of people talk about the works of mercy, you know, and feeding the poor and all that, and that's good. But remember, also, correcting the ignorant. That's a spiritual work of mercy. And that's why just the other day I loved this about uh, the retired Archbishop uh, Chaput. Remember, he, oh, he was so great. wish he wasn't retired, actually. But he actually said, because, you know, there are actually people today, I'm getting in dangerous territory here, but I, I don't know, it, it, they've said it. There are actually people today who said that they will give Holy Communion to Joe Biden. This is a man who is not in good standing with the Catholic Church. He is in favor of abortion on every level. He himself has officiated at the marriage of two gay men. I'm not making this up. So the Archbishop Chaput said yesterday, it is not a matter of politics to deny him communion. It's a matter of pastoral care. A good shepherd doesn't give to the sheep what is ultimately going to be to their ruin which is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. You're in a bad state. You're in serious sin. To, for me to do this to you would be bad 
for you and me, actually, because it's known publicly what you support. I mean, seriously, this is why true love is willing to say no. A good father says no. In a loving way, yes, with compassion. And I'm, I guarantee you that the good archbishop would want to meet with him and tell him why. Not because I'm a hater, because you're, you're a lost human being. No, because this is right, this is wrong. And here's what you have to do to correct it so that you can receive Holy Communion. That's what a good father does. Right? That, that, and that, that's what a good father does on every other level, whatever issue it would be. This is right, this is wrong. I don't hate you, I love you. As a matter of fact, I'm saying this because I love you. Remember when, when Jesus himself, some people said, again, John chapter 6, they said, this is a hard saying, we're walking away, John 666. What did Jesus do? Oh, I'm sorry, did I offend you? Come on, group hug, kumbaya, let's everybody just get together and have a little, you know. No. He let him walk away. Why? Because he's mean, nasty Jesus and he hates him? No. Because he loves him. Truth doesn't change. You'll know when you go through the crisis where you can come back because the one who loved you told you and wasn't afraid to tell you the truth even though you walked away. I could go into a lot of that stuff, but it's a huge issue today, guys. A huge issue. What is the line between protecting our family with firearms while also laying down our life for our friends as martyrs? Yep. Right? A lot of people today, they're so wanting to get rid of guns and all that kind of stuff. You have a right to bear arms, okay? It doesn't mean you got to be Rambo, okay? But you have a right to do this. You have to do it in the right way. But let me tell you something. If you who are married and have a family, wife and children, and somebody comes to your house to rob your house and to do horrible things to your wife and your daughter, are you going to dialogue with them at the door? I don't think so. Shh, shh. You better leave. Okay, that's your house. You have a right to defend your wife and your children if it comes to that. Doesn't mean you go out on the hunt, you know, no, of course not. But you have a right to do this, okay? So, and this is basic teaching, this is common sense, this is no brainer. But everybody today is just so offended, politically correct, and, and thinks that it's just a bunch of a white men who hate everybody else and have firearms. What kind of craziness is this? This is normal. This is normal. So yes, we have to be sacrificial, and if, if it comes to it, we should be the ones who are virtuous and strong if the weak and defend, defenseless don't need our protection, okay? We should be able to stand before a firing squad and say, Viva Cristo Rey, and become martyrs. But if you have a wife and, and child that requires your defense, are you going to sit there and watch them while they get raped and beat? Mm, no way. No way. You have a right to defend yourself and your wife and your children. Is it okay to question um, some of the statements uh, from our present pontiff? I am not going to answer that. Um, that's a setup. Um, <laughs> pray for him. That's all I can say. These are tough times. I want to unleash like a fire hydrant right now, but I better not. Pray. That should be the answer you need.